My name is Dagmara Bożek. I'm from Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. I'm a science communication and education specialist. And uh, today within the Interact webinar, I will talk a little bit about the polluted Arctic. What are the, what are the main threats? Of course, I will not cover all of them, but I will give some examples of uh, the pollution that might be observed in the Arctic. So, uh, to start with, a little bit about the Arctic as the region of the Earth. Uh, it is located, as we know, in the northern hemisphere uh, around the North Pole. So it means that it's mainly covered by the sea ice, but not only because some uh, states uh, like Canada, US, uh, Russia, um, Denmark or Norway have uh, their territories uh, in the Arctic. So it means that they are the Arctic states. That information will be uh, helpful for us uh, in the end of our presentation when we will we'll talk about the Arctic Council as an organization that is responsible for protecting, uh, uh, among the others, uh, the Arctic as a natural uh, region of the Earth. So, um, another thing, uh, because sometimes when we are talking and thinking about the Arctic, or we have in our mind the polar bears as a main example of the wildlife and the rest of the animals, the living organisms that we uh, meet uh, in the Arctic. But uh, it's not the whole truth, the truth uh, because of course uh, there are many uh, populations around 19th of uh, the polar bears around the Arctic, but it's also home for 4 million people. Uh, the indigenous people, there are 10% of that group. So it means that there are many group of interest uh, in that area. And we, when we are thinking about the protection of the wildlife, we need to think also about the protection of the traditional lifestyle of the indigenous people. And of course, their rights and needs. So, um, during today's presentation, I will go through some uh, examples of the threats uh, that are connected with the uh, Arctic. Uh, of course, they are not all of them um, because it's impossible to do it in a such uh, short time period. But I think that I will focus on the main of them. So, the first one are, are wildfires. After that, POPs and PCBs, like the examples of um, chemical substances that are unfortunately toxic and cancerogenic to all living organisms, uh, heavy metals and microplastic um, in the end. Um, of course, when we are talking about the Arctic, the first thing that comes to our mind is the climate change. Of course, it's the main factor that is affecting uh, the Arctic nowadays uh, very much. But uh, today's uh, classes wouldn't be devoted to the climate change itself. But there is a very nice uh, webinar given by Agata Gozdzik, my colleague from the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences, on climate change. It's called Stories of the Sea Ice. And it's available on YouTube of the Interact project and on the website. Here is the link to the webinar. Uh, that presentation would be the part of the educational toolkit available on uh, Interact uh, website. So without any problems, you will find it and you can use those links uh, to the sources, uh, many types of them uh, connected with today's topic. The wildfires as the first examples of some threats uh, affecting uh, the Arctic. So uh, here is a very uh, interesting animation uh, compiled uh, basing on the data obtained by NASA. And uh, during the uh, time period from the March 2000 uh, until August 2023, you have a chance to observe uh, the animation of the wildfires spread out uh, around the globe. So um, thanks to the visualization, you can see that uh, 
wildfires might occur in many places in regions of the earth, but uh, how do they um, uh, connect it with the Arctic? Because uh, in the Arctic, we didn't observe a lot of wildfires. Of course, in Canada, in some northern parts of Canada or on Siberia, the topic of the uh, wildfires are very important and uh, dangerous one, but uh, there are two terms created uh, by the scientists to describe the phenomenon of the pollution um, that that as a result of uh, the wildfires came to the Arctic. We can talk about black carbon and brown carbon. So, uh, black carbon is the result of diesel engines work uh, of the coal burning or cooking stoves. And brown carbon, it's a type of pollution which is the result of burning of trees and vegetation mainly. But of course, it's also you know, from some fossil fuels but uh, the wildfires is the main source of that let's say brown carbon so um, those type of pollution came to the arctic and affect the environment which is in our imagination kind of pure and untouched pristine environment but unfortunately it's not it means that um, due to uh, anthropogenic activity the arctic is affected more and more by some toxic and chemical substances. Uh, there is also information uh, about the Arctic amplification that might be emphasized here because uh, it is the term that describes the phenomenon that the Arctic as a region of the Earth is uh, the fast warming uh, region in our planet and it uh, is uh, warming uh, three or, or uh, two or three times faster than the rest of the globe. So it is connected with the albedo effect because when we have a thick surface of the sea ice on the Arctic Ocean and uh, it is very thick, it, ha it can reflect the sunlight very uh, efficiently but unfortunately when it's melting and we have the um, holes in the structure of the sea ice more sunlight is absorbed uh, by the sea which is uh, dark in the color and not much of the worm is uh, reflect uh, back to the atmosphere so it means that uh, the piece of um, warming the arctic is uh, speeds up and unfortunately as a result we can observe uh, that uh, the processes of melting of the sea ice are faster and faster so the arctic amplification is a term that might be here very helpful to get to know what kind of phenomena we observe nowadays in the arctic Pollution trapped in the ice is this the another topic concerning uh, Arctic uh, because um, on the one side we think and we are we talk about the pollution that came from the rest of the globe uh, using different ways it might be as a result of precipitation river discharge uh, ocean currents or contamination that are transported by the earth it's the one thing and the second thing is uh, during some periods of time the pollution uh, were accumulated on the icy surface and they were trapped into the ice but now when the arctic ice is melting those the pollutions are released into the atmosphere so unfortunately those two ways of transportation the pollution in the arctic have the same impact on the natural environment. So not only the ice is the source of uh, pollution trapped uh, into its structure, but it's also permafrost. Uh, permafrost, it's a permanently frozen ground uh, for uh, 
two or more years. That is typical to polar regions. Uh, on Siberia, we observed, the scientists observed, a uh, very um, fast um, piece of uh, thawing of the permafrost. Uh, so it means that uh, the landscape is changing. It is affecting the lifestyle of the traditional group of the people living there. But it also, uh, in terms of uh, pollution, release some greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or methane into the atmosphere because some organic matter that was uh, beneath the permafrost and now when it's thawing all those gases are released and uh, it is not main, maybe connected uh, with today's topic but of course it also is the case of some bacteria and uh, viruses that also might be trapped in the permafrost and they are also being released. It's hard to say what result it will have, it might have on the living organism, on the wild animals and the humans um, as well, but uh, that matter is uh, observed by the scientists and analyzed. So they are also some scientific paper covering that topic. So um, when we talk about uh, some uh, pollutions, uh, pollution that are trapped into the structure of the permafrost of the Arctic ice, we need to uh, talk more about uh, the type of uh, that pollution. So um, our second point and third point of the agenda of today's classes is POPs group of the chemical substances and PCBs. So we have uh, persistent organic pollutants and polychlorinated biphenyls. The first uh, is a group of uh, pesticides, insecticides, solvents, or pharmaceuticals. Mm, and they, it, uh, uh, and uh, 12 of them were marked as uh, the most dangerous and toxic to the living organisms. So here is uh, only a few examples of the POPs. The, uh, chemical substances that uh, are called like this. And uh, when you are talking about the PCBs, they are mainly uh, came, they mainly come from industrial and consumer products. Um, those chemical substances nowadays are banned uh, and uh, are they are not in use anymore. But it doesn't mean that they aren't found, they can't be found in the natural environment because uh, they have the possibility to accumulate. So now we have two definitions, two terms connected with those uh, toxic substances like bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Bioaccumulation is connected with um, the process when those uh, substances, harmful substances are um, um, accumulated into the living organism and over its lifetime, the amount of uh, that substances is bigger and bigger. So it means when we have the agile individual, the amount of those toxic substances is very big in, his, in its organism. And biomagnification is connected with the food chain. Uh, when we have many trophic levels of the food chain, and small organisms, which are eaten by the bigger organism, accumulate and accumulate the contaminant, the contamination. And when we are going through the highest levels or higher levels of the, the, the food chain, the biggest organisms have, unfortunately, the biggest amounts of those uh, toxic substances. For us humans, it's uh, rather not that bad, not that good information because we eat uh, some marine uh, organisms. It's a uh, part of our diet, so it's it's not a good good option because it uh, may affect our health and our life even. Um, when we are talking about those um, groups of substances, uh, they we you know are bioaccumulative, which is connected with those two terms like bioaccumulation and biomagnification. They are highly toxic and cancerogenic to humans and the wildlife. And 
they can be transported over longer distances. And that's why they are found in the Arctic. Because um, we might ask ourselves, what is the source in the Arctic of PCBs or COPs? There are not of any of them, but all of the substances, harmful substances, are transported from the different uh, places in the Earth. Like many other things, like plastic, microplastic. Heavy metals, uh, another factor that uh, affects uh, the Arctic wildlife and the environment. Uh, the mercury, I will focus mainly on it. Um, there is a very uh, interesting organization called AMAP. I will tell you a little bit uh, about it in the last slide of my presentation. Um, it's uh, observing, it's monitoring the um, levels of the mercury uh, in, in the environment, in Arctic environment, and they create um, a lot of interesting report on that uh, topic. And on their website, you can find a special um, link uh, with the pieces of information concerning the uh, mercury contamination. And uh, for example, such kind of visualization uh, covering the topic of mercury transport in 2015. Um, it is um, created uh, based on some data collected within the monitoring program of AMAP. And uh, thus, you can see that mercury um, as a substance might be uh, transported all over the globe and it's almost everywhere. What are the sources of the mercury? They may, may be of the natural origin, which means they it uh, comes from volcanoes, uh, rock weathering and uh, geothermal activity, but not only. Uh, the sources may be also of the anthropogenic origin, so it is as a result of combustion of fossil fuels and smelting activities. On the right side, there is an info, uh, infographic covering the topic, and uh, we know that the natural source, sources of uh, the um, mercury are not so harmful in comparison to the anthropogenic sources. Uh, so the amount of mercury released um, into the environment is higher than that one of the natural origin. Uh, of course, the uh, atmospheric uh, and oceanic way of transportation helps uh, to spread the mercury uh, all over the, the air. I mentioned that uh, accumulation of uh, toxic substances uh, in living organisms may affect our diet, um, our health. Uh, we as uh, Europeans maybe are not in such big trouble like the indigenous people because they are uh, traditional lifestyle, traditional way of uh, preparing food based mainly on the um, marine mammal uh, of the Arctic. So it means that when they are affected by some pollution, as a result, those people will um, observe uh, harmful effects uh, on their health due to uh, that, that type of a diet. So that problem is uh, widely described in scientific papers, but not only, also in some news published in the newspapers, local uh, uh, ones, for example, that there is a, a obvious connection between uh, the pollution in the Arctic with the state of health of indigenous, indigenous people. So many diseases uh, might are observed and the rate of uh, harmful effects uh, is rising, unfortunately. So now um, the one of the main um, effort of the uh, Arctic institution is to help the indigenous population uh, to cope with uh, the result of the global, uh, uh, global climate change and uh, pollution in the Arctic. Uh, last but not least, micro and plas plastic uh, in general. 
it's also very uh, harmful thing uh, to the natural environment, uh, unfortunately. Um, the Arctic, the plastic can't be found itself in the Arctic because it's not produced there. And uh, people who live in the Arctic or to uh, travel in the Arctic uh, rather don't uh, look, don't um, uh, br don't bring too many litters with themselves to leave leave them in the in the Arctic. But all of those plastic uh, mainly is uh, transported by the ocean currents from different places and very distant sometimes in the world. So it means that uh, the plastic litter, which is disposed in inappropriate way here in Europe, for example, might reach the Arctic uh, due to some uh, uh, due to uh, ocean currents. Uh, as, as a result, of course, it's a very long way, but still possible. And yeah, and plastic and microplastic, unfortunately, is in the Arctic. It's in the snow. The um, scientists reveal uh, it's in the air. It's in the soil, even in the water. So I, nowadays, it's a very big threat to all of us not only to, to the Arctic uh, wildlife. Uh, it, microplastic is also in a food chain because small particles of the microplastic is eaten by some kind of fishes. And after that, it is transported within the food chain to our plates because many of us eat uh, fishes and other uh, type of meat that came from the oceans. Here is a very interesting uh, website, uh, ourworldindata.org, uh, where you can find uh, some information about the plastic pollution. And here you can see the map of uh, the world and you can check which country uh, produce what amount of the plastic. I choose Poland because it's my home country. So it's not, it's not that bad, I would say. In comparison, some uh, to some other countries um, from the from our globe, uh, but still the topic is uh, worth uh, to uh, be analyzed in some detail and need a special approach to somehow solve it and cope with it. Another interesting source of the knowledge concerning the plastic is uh, litterbase.evi.da. Uh, and it uh, is connected with the distribution of some litter types. And of course, plastic is uh, one of them. Uh, so you can choose uh, any uh, region in the earth you want. So I choose Svalbard archipelago. So unfortunately, it's uh, also in the Arctic, but as you can see on the uh, western shore of that archipelago, the uh, plastic litter is observed and it's there. It's already there. And it is transported by the ocean currents, by the Gulf Strom, for example, and is accumulated on a shore. Um, that uh, database is being updated. Uh, so month by month, you can uh, watch that another publication, which means places with data about the litter is added to that database. So I think it's a quite good uh, source of uh, some data uh, concerning the plastic litter around the world and the Arctic, because the Arctic is our main topic today. There is a very nice uh, foundation called Soil Science, and it was uh, established by my colleagues from the Institute of Geophysics. And they have uh, some projects uh, concerning some environmental issues. One of them was uh, the uh, project that had been carried out uh, from 2019 until 2021. Um, and it was called Sorkap Marine Litter Cleanup. Sorkap is the region in southern part of the Spitsbergen Island. And as you can see, that southern part is also affected by plastic pollution. And uh, the aim of the project was to clean 
to clean the shore uh, from the uh, plastic marine litter. And the result of the project is like this, that uh, for 24 days, they had been working into, in the field in general. They clean more than 30 kilometers of uh, the shore, the coastline. And uh, the final uh, weight of the uh, letter collected was uh, almost six tons. Uh, it's it's a quite huge number, but in general, when we are thinking about uh, the those piles of marine plastic litter, it's only a very small fragment of it. But still, it's good to, to have such kind of uh, projects because they, they emphasize the need of um, caring uh, of our environment and show that the problem is uh, visible and we need to do something with it. And in the last part of my presentation, I will tell you a little bit about some law regulation concerning the pollution problem. So uh, the first thing, that was very important to the Arctic was um, the um, document signed in Rovaniemi in the very beginning of the 90s, and it's called Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy. It was uh, signed by the Arctic states, uh, and uh, the aim was the cooperation in terms of protection of Arctic ecosystem and the needs of the indigenous people. And one of the main aims was to identify, reduce and eliminate the pollution in the Arctic. So it was the first step uh, because some activities uh, were carried out uh, later, but they were uh, not that huge like uh, that strategy signed. Um, another step was to establish the Arctic Council. So strong relationships and cooperation uh, within the group of the uh, eight uh, Arctic countries. Uh, and the declaration was signed in September in Ottawa in 1996. And besides the eight member states, there are also uh, the observers, uh, the other countries that participated in the council somehow. And Poland is also among them. And also we have six working groups uh, that uh, cover different fields of interests and uh, topics concerning the Arctic. And uh, they help to solve some problems that are typical for the region. Uh, another uh, thing is the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, which means POPs. And in 2001, uh, the document was signed and it totally banned usage of the PCBs um, and POPs and some other chemical toxic substances. So uh, it was very important to not only to the Arctic, but also to uh, to us, to, to our world. And it, that convention helped effectively uh, decrease the amount of that uh, chemicals in the environment. But unfortunately, it doesn't mean that if we ban such kind of substances, um, we will not use any another substances uh, as an analog <laughs> uh, that also might be harmful. But it needs more uh, observations, research done on it. Um, but yeah, it is. It it was very important step. Uh, for for the protection of the Arctic wildlife, and that document was effective from two thousand and four. Uh, and another um, example of the ri rising awareness uh, among the indigenous population, because unfortunately, from um, when the period of exploring of the Arctic in scientific and um, economic uh, meaning started, uh, the needs and rights of the indigenous population were, were ignored. So, uh, unfortunately, from some period of time, 
we observed that uh, the rights and uh, the situation of the local people are being taken into the consideration by the other states that are the interest uh, in the Arctic. So it's very nice movement and nice approach. And uh, the Inuit petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights from 2005 indicates that indigenous population also uh, have rights to participate in the big discussion about the future of the Arctic. So it's very good example of some changes, mental changes among the indigenous population and uh, rising of their awareness in terms of their rights, needs, and the protection of their natural environment. And uh, on the last slide, I will focus more about the AMAP I've mentioned before during my presentation. AMAP, uh, uh, which is uh, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, is one of the working group within the Arctic Council. I mentioned that there are six working groups uh, in the Arctic Council. So the AMAP mainly works on uh, POPs uh, monitoring, uh, heavy metal monitoring, radioactivity as well, plastic and microplastic. They also um, regulate the uh, some uh, regulations concerning the Arctic uh, environment. They also monitor the situation in the ecosystems due to climate change. Uh, and of course, the uh, future um, possibilities for the wildlife and for the humans uh, living in the Arctic as well. Uh, so here is one of the examples of their monitoring. Uh, it was carried out uh, some time ago and it concerns the PCBs in ringed seals uh, living close to Greenland uh, because ringed seals are the main, um, one of the main animals that are hunted for food by the Inuits, by the indigenous people. So the contamination in the meat means uh, the real danger for those people. So that's why such kind of uh, monitorings are very important and give us the knowledge about the um, percentage of the pollutants uh, in, in the uh, Arctic. Uh, on AMAP um, website, you will find a lot of reports, a lot of uh, databases and interesting facts covering the natural state of the environment of the Arctic. So I strongly recommend you to watch it. And there are also some educational videos and uh, uh, presentations. So uh, thank you so much for today's classes. Mm -hmm.